Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Talking Disney Classics podcast. This is the show where we talk about the Disney animated films canon, and we let the random number generator tell us which one we are going to be talking about. And we are down to our final, well, three if you count Encanto. Uh, we are talking about Lilo and Stitch this uh, this month, and it's going to be so much fun. I'm looking forward to it. I'm film critic Rachel Wagner, and Stanford is here. Hi there. And we have a special guest with us today Yay. on the podcast. We have Josiah Milky here. And thank you, Josiah, for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks, Josiah. Hey, everybody. This is Josiah yes. Milky, world's biggest <laughs> Disney fan. And I am yeah. so excited to finally be on the Talking Disney podcast. I've been following <laughs> Rachel's blog uh, pretty much since it started six or seven years ago now yeah. when she first reviewed the Disney animated canon back in 2014 from <laughs> Snow White to Big Hero 6. Yeah. Yeah, I, in 2014, I tore my MCL in my knee and I needed something to do because I was just sitting around all day and I decided to to review the Disney canon. And that's why originally my blog was called 54 Disney Reviews because that's all it was intended to be, was, was going to be to reviewing at the time 54 Disney films. And, <laughs> and I just really enjoyed it. I enjoyed writing about film. I enjoyed um, my work as a critic. And it, it's all just kind of bloomed from there. So thank you for your support early on. That's very exciting. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yes. Thank uh, you. So what we, we like to do at the beginning of this show is we like to talk about our first experiences with the film. So Lilo and Stitch, it came out in 2002. It's the 42nd Disney animated feature film. And what about you, Stanford? What did you first think about it? When did you first see it? So, uh, you know, when 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 the, a new Disney uh, animated film gets released in theaters, it's always a big event for me, right? So yeah. I uh, went with some friends. I just didn't remember this. We didn't see it at a really fancy theater. Just kind of saw it at the local multiplex. And it was just fun that they were willing to go with me. <laughs> you know, you know? And I think everybody was kind of curious because the movie was marketed and just looked like it was going to be something different. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, yeah, so that was, that was, that was fun to go. And I think we had quite a discussion afterwards. I think, cause I, I think people's opinions varied about mm -hmm. the, about the film too. So yeah. that was, that was a, uh, uh, you know, an enjoyable night out of the movies for sure. Mm -hmm. What about you, Josiah? When did you first see this film? Well, I have to confess, I didn't see the film in theaters. Uh, I was seven when the movie came out. Yeah. So, so I didn't check it out until I checked it out on home video and watched it with my mom. My sisters were actually spending the weekend with my aunt at my grandparents' house. So they didn't get to watch it until after we picked them up. Um but then, uh, fast forward several years later, I remember distinctly I was going on a summer mission to Walt Disney World. It was actually in 2014 when you started your blog, Rachel, and I didn't want my sister Jordan. I have two younger sisters, and Jordan's the oldest of the two, and we had actually just rewatched Lilo and Stitch a few months before I was going on this trip, and I didn't want her to miss me too much, so... I figured I should get her a little care package or some sort of special gift in case she missed me. So, and luckily we had uh, the Target store that we were living nearby because um, we lived in Des Moines at the time. Now we live in Johnston here in Iowa. I got her the Lilo and Stitch 2 disc Big Wave Edition DVD from 2009 uh, that she could watch in case she ever missed me, which she never did. But in later years, we've watched it with the family and it's actually, it's not only one of my personal favorites, but my mom and my sisters both really, really love this movie. Um, so that's mm -hmm. my story of Lilo and Stitch. I didn't get to see it in theaters, but yeah. I saw it on home video. Although I did get to see Treasure Planet in theaters. I barely remember seeing that in theaters. Oh, my nice. dad took me back. My dad took me to see Treasure Planet in theaters, but I, I had to see Lilo and Stitch on home video. But mm -hmm. along with Hercules uh, from five years earlier, Lilo and Stitch and Hercules are my two guilty pleasure Disney animated features. Basically, if I want to watch something that's just fun, um, if, I'm, if, if I'm in the mood for something comedic, I'll pick Hercules. But if I'm in the mood for something that's fun, but also tugs at the heartstrings, mm -hmm. I'll pick Lilo and Stitch. So Lilo yeah. and Stitch is one of those... Underrated masterpieces, in my opinion, but it's one of my favorites. I I just love it. My family loves it. It's it's amazing. 
So when I first saw it, I think it was at the theater. I can't remember, to be honest, if I saw it at a theater or at home. But I remember not loving it when I first saw it, to be honest. It's one that's had to grow on me, and now I do enjoy it. But when I first saw it, I felt like it was just a little too bleak. And I still do agree that there are some points where they maybe go a little little over the top, like when the house gets blown up and things like that. It's just... it's. It's just piling on this poor, this poor family. Uh, and then also, and this is an unpopular opinion. I don't, and I never have loved the design of Stitch. I think he looks like a cockroach and I just don't <laughs> love that. <laughs> and like, you think, you think E.T. is cuter compared to Stitch? <laughs> E.T. looks ugly. You want a cute alien? Just get to the little green aliens from Pizza Planet. E.T. E. doesn't have antennae like cockroaches. <laughs> okay, and fair I point. I just don't love the design. I, I, it's, it's grown on me a little bit. I It's so all over the place uh, that I, I don't hate it as much as I originally did, but that I've never just loved. It's just, I wish that he had made him a little cuter. He's just kind of not my favorite, but uh, I have really warmed up to the film. It has a huge heart, this movie. And I do love the animation and the whole visual style of it. So we're going to have fun talking about that. But let's talk a little bit about the marketing campaign. Oh, yeah. yeah the went marketing. along with this movie. And what do you remember about that, Stanford? So I just remember that uh, they, if I'm not mistaken, they were, sh- Stitch was like invading uh, existing scenes from kind of. Classic movies from the Renaissance, mm-hmm. from the Disney Renaissance. Yep, and I remember which movies it was. He, oh, please, yeah, please remind me because I uh, is it I, the Little Mermaid. Yeah, uh, I think. Yeah, yeah Little Mermaid's on there. I, I remember what they are uh, in the order they were listed on the DVD. He interrupted Bella and Beast's ballroom dance scene in Beauty yeah, and the Beast. Yeah, that's right. He stole Jasmine away from Aladdin during their magic carpet ride in Aladdin. That's, okay, yeah. He came in on a surfboard right as Ariel was finishing part of your world reprise in Little Mermaid. And he takes the place of Baby Simba during the opening Pride Rock scene in Lion King. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And I think that was a fun concept, but I don't know if it necessarily sold the movie that well. Right? Like, I, I think a lot of people, including myself, were expecting something like Emperor's New Groove, something kind of really silly. And it's not. It's a pretty emotional movie yeah and yeah so I, while i think it was clever i don't know if it necessarily prepared people for what they were getting well i this is actually one of my favorite uh marketing campaigns that disney's ever mm-hmm. done because it was something i don't think they'd ever done something like this before yeah. i don't think they've done something like this before or since i mean pixar yeah. movies usually with pixar movies they tease the movie with scenes that's like that aren't even in the movie like if you look at the monsters inc teaser trailer for because uh, Monsters, Inc. was right before Lilo and Sketch. Um, none of the stuff in the teaser trailer is in the movie. It's Mike and Sully going into the wrong bedroom and the whole thing about Mike messing up. Magnolia, Mongolia. Remember in fifth grade, you spent all your time passing notes to Susie Boyles and blah, 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 blah. None of that is in the movie. Right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, no, yeah. and I totally get it. And it was very creative. I just don't think it necessarily prepared people for the actual movie, which is the yeah. point of a trailer. Do you agree, it seems Stanford? to me that it prepared you for... That Stitch was a disruptor or a disruptive yeah. character and naughty, kind of, you know, kind of <laughs> mischievous or naughty, but nothing else, right? I mean, nothing, yeah, uh, else about, you know, Lilo and Nani's relationship and all, you know, all that yeah. stuff, which I know we're going to get into, but. Yeah. And they also had Stitch all over the park. Uh, yeah. yeah. And it included a infamous uh, toilet papering of Cinderella's castle. I've read about that. Part. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm trying to remember if that toilet paper game of the castle was associated with the film's release or the opening of that Stitch attraction that oh, opened Stitch up. Oh, Stitch's Great Escape. I've been Stitch's there. Stitch's Great Escape, yeah, Walt Disney World and the Magic Kingdom, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not. I, I tend, I think it might be with the attraction. But that was controversial too, wasn't it? Like Stitch, yeah, like graffiti, you know, oh, yeah, spray paint on the castle or yeah, whatever they did, and toilet with, paper. 
It's Stitch's Great Escape opening day. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, rest in Wait. peace, Stitch's Great Escape. Uh, that yeah. one closed down a few years ago. I don't think Stitch does anything but meet and greets and the occasional parade or fantastic on the boat appearance anymore at the parks. Yeah. yeah. He doesn't have a presence at the parks, does he, anymore? Although he is still quite popular in Japan. And he, I don't know if you guys have heard about this, but one of the things they're doing for Walt Disney World's 50th anniversary celebration is the Disney Fab 50 character collection. They're going to have 50 characters as gold statues around the four Walt Disney World theme parks. And one of them is Stitch. Yeah, Stitch, Stitch is getting a statue, isn't he? Yeah, that's mm-hmm. right. Uh, yeah, so they, they had graffiti on the castle, Stitch is King. And then they had the, the toilet paper. And that was not very well liked. And yeah. the, the whole attraction, I've never been on it, Stitch Great Escape, but I've heard it's not good. You know, yeah, I uh, I have mixed feelings about the attraction, too, because, you know, it replaced a super controversial attraction that was called the Extraterrestrial Alien Terror Terrestrial mm-hmm. Alien Encounter. Mm-hmm. And that, yeah. that truly was scary i mean that you know you're, you're are you familiar with that how that worked i did, heard about it, I, it they had a defunct land i think on it okay yeah so you're sitting in the round you're in a seat and they have this really funky bar that comes over that, that comes over you almost like those roller coasters mm-hmm. that have a, a shoulder bar you know a bar that goes over your shoulders but it's so you can't you can't leave your seat you're stuck but it's but it, it's this it was it, it was this audio uh, contraption. So you'd you'd hear you'd hear kind of stuff, almost like in three hundred and sixty around you. You know the uh-huh. way that they have these speakers placed close to your head, uh, and um, and the tr- and the and the scary one. It's like this really gnarly alien, and it's you know and it's terrifying. And then the lights go out, and then the alien. They have it the way that they designed did the sound design. It's almost like it's right in your face. You can't see anything because it's pitch black. But the way you hear it, you know, it sounds like there's this alien right in your face. And mm-hmm. I think I think they had a lot. Disney had a lot of complaints. It was too scary <laughs> for right. the family. Yeah. You know, so they decided to make it more family friendly, and they added Stitch. And frankly, I thought it just made it stupid rather than mm-hmm. fun. Well, you see, know. the extraterrestrial ride, uh, I have to contradict that because I wasn't around when they had extraterrestrial aerial alien encounter, but I've been on Stitch's Great Escape, and when you think about it, I think Stitch feels right at home in Tomorrowland because he's adjacent to Buzz Lightyear Space Ranger Spin. Yeah, yeah, and good the- point. And the Monsters Incorporated Lab Floor show, even though the monsters aren't necessarily sci-fi, I mean, I guess it fits with the future motif with the Pixar theory that animals could evolve into the monsters from Monsters, Inc. So I guess it works with Tomorrowland if it was the future with outer space. So with Buzz Lightyear and Stitch, I guess it kind of makes sense. Yeah, I just heard it's not a very good ride, but I haven't been on it, so I don't know. But anyway, and, and that was closed, as you know, as yeah. as, uh, as mentioned. Yeah, that yeah. is closed. Uh, right. So then let's dive into the actual film. Then uh, the it starts out very, I feel like very Star Trek influenced with the um, even the names I think of the characters uh, with the in the experiment six two six. And the whole look of everything of the Federation, I think, looks a lot like Star Trek. That's a really good point. And they're all, yeah, like they're in uniforms, right? And Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. If it's okay, I'd like to share some behind the scenes trivia and some hidden Disney Easter eggs throughout the film. Because that's basically what I do, being Mm -hmm. a big Disney fan. Uh, Starting with the opening here, uh, Stitch was originally the leader of a gang. He had like three or four gang members, Jumba being one of them, who was left behind and was stuck in jail after a bank heist for many, many years. And when they screened that for the executives like Tom Schumacher and Roy E. Disney, uh, they were like, something's wrong with this character. We love the story and everything, but I'm just we're just not buying Stitch as a gang leader. So they redid the whole opening, and now Stitch is a biohazard, and Jumba's the one who created him. So that's how the beginning changed from Stitch being the leader of a gang. Now he's a biohazard, and Jumba, who was going to be one of his gang members, is now 
his creator, Jumbo Juice. Oh, interesting. Voiced. I just think with the, I just think with the Galactic Federation, that's very Star Trekky to me. Yeah. So he is Experiment Six Two Six, and he was created by the Doctor by, by Doctor Jumba. Right. And uh, he is supposed to be the ultimate uh, agent of chaos. And he wasn't supposed to create him. Uh, so the um, he sent uh, the he's supposed to destroy Stitch, and uh, he doesn't, and he ends up, uh, he, and Stitch ends up on Earth. Mm-hmm. And uh, so then uh, Doctor Jumba and Agent Pleakley are sent to go down and uh, and find Stitch. Agent Plakely, the so-called Earth expert, voiced by Kevin McDonald from Kids mm-hmm. in the Hall. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which, he's one of my favorite voice... I mean, actually, I think all the voice actors in this movie are really good. But mm-hmm. uh, his voice, I think, is hilarious. I just, his yeah. delivery, there's just something you know, great about Kevin McDonald. And and uh, he's very funny. Uh, yeah. What yeah. do you think about this opening uh, for Stitch? I like it. It's very action oriented. Um, we get to see Stitch and what a crafty character he is, and it's got some really good score. Alan Silvestri did the score for this movie. Mm-hmm. He was always their number one and number two choice for the film. You probably know him best for scoring all those Zemeckis movies like Roger Rabbit and Back to the Future. And a few years after this film, he scored one of my favorite animated Christmas movies, The Polar Express, starring Tom Hanks. Yeah, what do you think, Stanford, of this sort of opening? You know, I think it's it's an interesting opening, interesting way to you know to introduce the character. I'm with you. It does it does have a Star Trek. I I I I think it has a Star Trek kind of vibe uh-huh. too. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, the one thing that I instantly noticed, and I I mean, I, and just to just throw this into the mix, that all of the backgrounds in this film were done with watercolor. That you know, painted mm-hmm. with watercolors. Very influenced by Dumbo, and you do get that uh, <laughs> Easter egg of the of the little Dumbo plush. Yeah, uh, yeah. The... that's right. Lilo has a Dumbo plush doll on her her easel in her room. But I do uh, love the the whole watercolor aesthetic of the movie. I think it's really beautiful, and I'm yeah, it's huge, beautiful. Uh, I love Hawaii. It's like my favorite place. So the whole aesthetic of the water and the ocean and Hawaii and the hula and and all of that, I think, is so so nice. And I, oh, I totally agree. I love it. And I, the one thing I think that's so interesting about the watercolor stuff is that it really is interesting to do that. They did those interiors of of you know the Galactic Federation, and also like the interior of the spaceships are done in watercolors, and it just gives it you know, mm-hmm. such an interesting look. Yeah, uh, that's something uh, that's something that I really enjoy, and I remember really enjoying that. On the big screen too, when I you know when I when I saw that opening weekend, because mm-hmm. uh, again, I mean not, for me nothing beats a big screen experience. Yeah. Even though it's still, I would love to you see can still enjoy it. I still enjoyed it, uh, you know, mm-hmm. on this on on my TV too. And there's two original songs that are done by Mark Kalai. Kalai, uh, Mark Kalai, Hello Malo. Yes. And uh, I love both of them. I think they're oh, really beautiful. Uh, and you have the children's chorus. Uh, they're singing with them, the Hawaiian roller coaster ride and the Hey Mele No Lilo. I love yep. that. I love both those songs. I think they're beautiful. I'm with mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. They're great. Good stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then we start out, we get to know Lilo. She's definitely an odd little girl. She has her own way of kind of thinking things. She wants to feed sandwiches to the fish. Uh, she she uh, is just genuinely weird with her dolls. And uh, the, her doll is named Scrump. And uh, she, that she made this doll and it lays eggs in its head. And there's just a lot of unusual things about she likes to take pictures of fat people at the beach she thinks they're beautiful uh things that are unusual and then she gets in a fight with the girls at the hula class and then she actually beats one of them up which i think i don't know if you would necessarily do you think you'd see that now mm-hmm. in a Disney film for the protagonist 
I mean, you might see people fighting with each other. I mean, if you look at the animated films that have come, that have come out recently, you know, stuff like Spirit Untamed and Pixar's Luca, you have uh, kids that argue with each other, you know, because the kids in Luca don't always get along. But I'm not sure they would necessarily hit each other. Yeah, they throw a punch. Because they don't hit each other in Luca. And even Spirit Untamed, uh, Abigail, uh, she doesn't hurt her little brother Snap. She just ties him up with a lasso when he's constantly trying to get into yeah. trouble with her. Lilo actually even bites her at one point. Which, yeah. yeah. I didn't, but I don't see a bite mark on the girl's hand, arm, so I think she might just be <laughs> overreacting. So, yeah, what do you think, Stanford, about Lilo? It's just this sort of strange, you know, I awkward think, girl. I, I, I think, you know, we, we, we learned early on that Lilo's got some issues. Mm-hmm. And and uh, uh, I, th- I think it's an, you know, an interesting way that they – how that kind of gets revealed. Because mm-hmm. I feel like her – her uh hitting her friend you know or her her schoolmate and and uh and you're right like the feeding of the how she feeds this fish the sandwich and stuff that uh it's it's like compensating for something mm-hmm. and and when, of course we learn later in the film what's going on but but uh i think it's an interesting way to 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 make her quirky and interesting and sympathetic like you know you're just like curious to know what what's causing this in her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, and she feels re- very real. Uh, that She does. And, and I, lo- I think she looks real. I love, mm-hmm. I love both the designs of Lilo and of, and of Nani. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I think that they look, they look real to me. Mm-hmm. You know I mean? They're very distinctive, mm-hmm. you know, in, in the Chris Sanders kind of, you know, the director of it. I think he's got a very distinct visual style with his character mm-hmm. designs, but, but, uh, uh, I, I I love the look. I, I love I love the clothes they put her into because they're just so Hawaiian. Yeah, <laughs> yeah me too. Love I, it. I have to give most of the credit for Lilo's animation to her supervising animator Andreas Deja. Yeah, now, Andreas mind, Deja. Now keep yeah. in mind, this is the same guy that did big man type heroes like Hercules and also villains like Scar and the Lion King and Jafar and Aladdin. So to yeah. see him go from big strong men that are mostly villains to animating a little girl is a pretty big jump for a He's, Polish Disney yeah. animator. That's a really good point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and I definitely connected with Nani as a character because uh, I was kind of sometimes placed in that mini mom role uh, in my family because I'm the oldest girl. I was going to say, aren't you the oldest sister, yeah, Rachel, in your yeah. family? Yeah, I, I'm the oldest girl, and uh, my mom had uh, through had a baby when I was ten, when I was sixteen, when I was eighteen. And I had to be kind of the mini parent many times, obviously not to such an extent, but I definitely had a lot of times where I would think about like what would happen if I had to all of a sudden take over that role. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> maybe that's part of the reason why this was a little too close, close to yeah, home yeah. <laughs> at that time, because it, it, when it came out, um, my youngest sister would have just been three. So <laughs> it was pretty, okay. pretty close. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Um, but they had start out with this this kind of fight between them, and uh, they uh, she says that at least a rabbit would be better than you, and <laughs> and then you get later on you get Lilo saying we're a broken family, aren't we? And then I liked you better as a sister than a mom. And this definitely rings true for me. This was many years later, but I I would sometimes feel pretty stressed out going to visit my family uh, because I you know it just wasn't like the relaxing vacation for Christmas or whatever that uh, that most people would have. You know, when you're in college and things like that. And, and it was a lot of work, you know, with little kids and everything. And and one time, my little brother, he says to me, he says, he says, Rachel, I like you a lot better in Utah than California. Oh, wow. And so when she says, uh, she says, I like you better as a sister than a mom. I, I feel like that's pretty close, pretty connected. But it's yeah. hard when you are put in that kind of role, 
obviously mine wasn't to such an extreme, but anyway, I connected with that whole, that whole scene. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lilo and Nani's relationship actually reminds me more of my relationship with my dad. Cause we don't mm -hmm. always have the same, the same interests. Uh, we don't always agree on stuff. And if we push each other too far, it can result in, uh, yelling and fighting and whatnot, mm -hmm. like the girls do. But then, you know, we come down to earth. We try to apologize and make up for what yeah. we said to each other. And she says, you like me better as a sister than a rabbit, right? And mm -hmm. that's a very cute, cute moment. Uh, we also see Lilo praying. And she says, I need someone to be my friend. Maybe oh, some angel. That yeah. Yeah, yeah not many Disney characters prayed. Last time Disney Animation did that was six years before this with Esmeralda with the song God Help the Outcasts mm. and Hunchback. Yeah. That's true. I forgot about that. But it also kind of reminded me of uh, In the Rescuers. Right. When Penny, Penny did yeah. that. When Penny, yeah. Uh, and so then we get to the, the scene with Lilo adopting Stitch. And that's a fun scene. I and mean, you see all the animals, all the dogs have climbed up. <laughs> they're afraid of Stitch. Yeah, I freaked you out my Stitch. Mm -hmm. and I, I actually just rewatched the commentary earlier today to get uh -huh. ready for this review. Uh, the two black and white dogs and the group of dogs that Stitch frightens, those are actually writer director Dean DeBlas' dogs. His Boston Terrier, oh, really? Theodore, actually has a few cameos in the movie. He's also in that book of dog breed that Molly's looking through later at night when she's looking through a book of dog breeds trying to figure out what kind of dog Stitch is. And she's talking to David on the phone. So, yep, that's director Dean DeBlas, Boston Terrier. Nice. Um, which actually reads uh, very sweet for me because my family currently has a Boston Terrier. Mm, nice. Oh, nice. Uh, so she she buys Stitch for $2. And then Stitch sees the giant tarantula movie, which I thought was kind of a fun uh, moment. Uh, that yeah, he's, that, he's watching this awesome horror movie, a 1950s horror mm -hmm. movie, right? It's on mm -hmm. TV. Yeah. In a store and, window, part two, what appears to be a Chinese restaurant called Mulan Wok. W O K Wok. Nice. Which later yeah. on, Nani has a the yeah. actual poster for the movie. Nani Mulan has the movie her, poster. Yeah. Which is funny because Tia Carrere was actually considered to voice Mulan before they went with Ming Na, but Tia Carrere is the voice of Nani now, so the Mulan poster is a nice callback to the fact that if if they if they couldn't go with Ming Na, Tia might have been the voice of Mulan. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we get our first of the Elvis songs. There's five Elvis songs in this movie. And Actually, we heard one of them earlier when Lila was on the floor listening to her record player. She was listening to Heartbreak Hotel. But now we get the first Elvis montage with Stuck on You. All okay, right, fair enough. Uh, so it's uh, Stuck on You, Burning Love, Suspicious Minds, Heartbreak Hotel, You're the Devil in Disguise, Hound Dog, and Can't Help Falling in Love. So I guess more than, why did I say five? Anyway, seven. There's seven. <laughs> and keep in mind, uh, Burn in Love and Can't Help Falling in Love, those are Elvis songs, but they're covers during the end credits because Burn in Love is performed by Wynonna, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And Can't Help Falling in Love is performed by the teen pop group A-Teens, who are supposed to be Swedish. Why, okay. That's I why was... I had five. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's yeah, two okay. covers. Songs, yeah, that Elvis sings. You know, I love the Elvis stuff in it, actually. I think that's just so um, out there, and it worked. I love how they put his picture, and it's actually, you know, a picture of him, rather than, like, a, a drawing. Mm -hmm. Or if it is a drawing, they make it look like a photograph. No, nope, I, I think that's a real photo. I've seen that I photo love, before in real just, life. And, and that, you know, saying Elvis is a model citizen. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I just love yeah. it. I just, Cracks it, me up. It makes sense because Elvis has such a tie to Hawaii. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. With the movie Blue Hawaii. In fact, Blue they, Hawaii. Play, they actually play that song in the background during the Luau dinner scene right after the Stuck on You montage, if you listen closely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then we also get uh, our first appearance of Cobra Bubbles. Uh, I, You don't blame him for being concerned about Lilo. It makes sense. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that's one of the things that's, I mean, I know that it was by design, but it's so frustrating in that, you know, you just want Nani to have a break because she's trying so hard and, and everything goes wrong, you know, mm -hmm. uh, all the time, particularly when Cobra Bubbles shows up. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. I think Ving Rhames is actually the only uh, big name celebrity in this movie. You know, we associate him with all those tough guy action movies that kids can't watch. So to get him in a Disney animated film, that's like part of the genius, wouldn't you say? Oh, for sure. Yeah, he does a good job. I also like David as a character. I think that he has a good relationship with Nani, and I'd say that he is one of the better of your sort of Disney boyfriends. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, every time I read about Lilo and Stitch, David always gets the short end of the stick, and I'm with you. Um, I would say aside from maybe Aladdin, David is probably my favorite of the Disney adult guy uh, love interest, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. And his relationship with Nani is actually quite realistic because it's hinted they do like each other because Leo tells David, Nani likes your butt and your fancy hair. Um, mm -hmm. but, but they also know that Nani's not available emotionally. Um, but David is patient with her and he does whatever he can to help the family because he loves them. And the great thing is they got actual Hawaiians to voice Nani and David, Tia Carrere mm -hmm. and Jason Scott Lee. Mm -hmm. And so then uh, Lilo ends up losing her job because of everything that happens at the Luau. Nani? And, I'm sorry, did I say that? I, Nani ends up losing her job because of everything that happens with the Luau. And that's obviously a huge problem with, she knows with, with uh, the Cobra Bubbles coming. And uh, the um, you also have uh, Peekly and... Uh, and Gemma getting attacked by uh, mosquitoes. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, Plagley thinks that mosquitoes are an endangered species. And uh, Jumba says, I never gave 626 a greater purpose. And this is when uh, that Stitch finds the story of the ugly duckling. Uh, right. He found it a little early, but, but this is when we get to see uh, that that story is really starting to change Stitch, which was cute. I still haven't seen the original Ugly, Dugly, Sil Ugly Duckling Silly Symphony short that Walt Disney did in the 40s. I've read the story, I know how it goes, but I still haven't actually seen the short. But um, mm -hmm. but yeah, this is a cute moment. Uh, this is where Stitch finally starts to connect to something, and we see him uh, later on in the film uh, trying to fit himself into the family, and of course, you know how that goes. Right. Uh, so I love the whole surfing s sequence uh, with ha Hawaiian roller coaster ride. I think that that whole scene is really beautiful. Do you agree, Stanford? Oh, absolutely. I think it's yeah. one of my favorite uh, sequences in the film. Mm -hmm. I would say yeah. this is. I would say this is definitely if you're gonna do a soundtrack of best Disney songs for your summer vacation, this should be in your top ten, hands down. It's fun, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's such a such a good song. And uh, then Bubbles, he he says that uh, he's going to take Lilo away the next morning because of what he saw with uh, with Lilo almost drowning and everything going on. So, uh, and if, and then Nani says to Stitch, "I really believe," or David says to Stitch, "I really believed they had a chance, and then you came along." Hitting so. it right on the head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I love the whole scene between Nani and Lilo, uh, the Aloha Oi, when she's singing to her. Oh, and that's then so we sweet. Yeah, we haven't really talked about Hohana means family, and that means nobody gets left behind, which is the heart of this whole movie. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we also hear is where we find out where that the their parents died in a car accident and Lilo says it was rainy they went for a drive and she asked Stitch what happened to yours and she says I hear you cry at night mm -hmm. and she says to Stitch if you want to leave you can I'll remember you though which is very sweet and that's when he takes the ugly duckling book and is hoping to recreate that moment in the forest because he's hoping there's a family out there for him. Uh, going back and rewatching this uh, in later uh, watch throughs of this movie, uh, for some reason, that I'm lost scene when Stitch recreates it in the forest. Um, nowadays, it actually reminds me of the first Toy Story when Woody and Buzz get left behind at the gas station 
Andy's car, Andy's mom drives the car off with the kids without the gang. And what he's like, doesn't he realize that I'm not there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then Jumba and Peekly get fired from trying to find. (laughs) And, uh, but then David finds a job for, for Nani and uh, he, she leaves. I don't know why she wouldn't just take Lilo with her. At least she can just stay in the car. Um, as opposed Good to having point. the house alone. Uh, but yeah, it ends up being a disaster. The house disaster. Ends, yeah, the house ends up getting blown up. And that's where I feel like it maybe went a little too far. I mean, there's just only so much trauma that you can uh, absorb for a character and when she's having Lilo getting taken away the house is destroyed she you know she's just found this job I guess but she's struggling with all of that as well I just feel like it's a lot especially for a Disney film a lot to pile on to a character and I I just kind of wish they hadn't gone that far and had the house blow up at least it's not as uh heartbreaking and um uh, what's the word scary for little kids i guess for lack of a better word as the fire and rescue climax in bolt six years later Hmm. i I mean that scene was prop i'd say that was probably scarier and more heartbreaking than this part if i'm being Hmm. perfectly honest I don't know if I agree, but I just think a lot for it's a lot for Nani, and I just felt so bad for her when she is when she is saying, "Don't turn that way, don't turn that way, don't turn it." Oh, and then she oh, knows, it and it's just. And then when when uh, Lilo gets taken away, and she says, "Nobody else understands her but me," and I mean, it's just, it's it's rough. It's a lot. Mm. I think. Uh, what do you think, Stanford? Oh, I do too. I, you know, I, um, and that's what, actually one of the frustrations I have with this film is that uh, it's like it's almost too much uh, for mm-hmm. for Nani because she's. And again, I know that's it's the point. Yeah, yeah. I think it was just like the the, uh, the whole third act uh, is, is 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 tough. I think in that regard because you know she's trying so hard and she never gets a break. Yeah, and then they blow up the house, you know, with their silly little fight, you know, that, that, that they're having. And then, um, not only does Cobra take Lilo, but then, then she gets kidnapped by, you know, mm-hmm. the spa- by Wes's bucket. Yeah. Captain Ganto. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and, and she's just left there on her, uh, uh, with the, um, you know, in that ship and, and Nani can see, uh, her getting taken away. I mean, you think yeah. how terrifying that would be. I know. Just think, it's just too much. Mm-hmm. It's too much. Yeah. It's too, and, and, and um, yeah, kind of frustrating. Yes. At least, you know, from my, from my perspective, mm-hmm. from, uh, you know, on the story. Yeah. And then when he, they say on the bright side, you won't have to yell at anyone anymore. That's just like, Oh, Oh, just trying <laughs> so hard. I know. And, uh, I feel so bad for her. Uh, but they're able to find Stitch's ship, and then you have this whole scene with Stitch stopping his truck. And, and your rep- this represents the single biggest change in the movie. Originally, um, Nani, Stitch, Jumba, and Pleakley stole, and I can't believe I'm saying this, they stole a 747 airplane and flew through the streets of downtown Honolulu <laughs> to go after Dan to ship. But then... Oh dear. But then, after the September 11th attacks happened, they realized that just wasn't going to work anymore. But, luckily, they had a story hole where they realized, well, we never found out how Jumba and Fleekly got to Earth. So, they have this big red spaceship that Jumba and Fleekly had, and that's what they use instead to go after Gantu's ship. And instead of flying through Honolulu, they fly through this island canyon. And so, then we have the, the scene with Lilo saying, so you came back. Uh, and, and nobody gets left behind and then this is my family it's a little it's little and it's broken but it's still good it's very sweet mm-hmm. and that gets back to the heart of the film and i i think that the, i would say that this is a film that's very emotionally true it feels like it feels like some 
some emotions that almost anybody could relate to with family because families are hard and it's hard uh, making everything work, especially when you've had this kind of trauma like they've had. Uh, so I think that, that that's the strength of this film is just how emotionally uh, true and relatable and the whole, oh, the whole Ohana message I think is really great. But fortunately, uh, it all works out. Stitch gets to stay with Lilo. Nani and Lilo mm -hmm. get to stay together. And cue the music. Cue the closing mm -hmm. montage with Lilo, the aliens, David, and Cobra all becoming family. You know, they rebuild the yeah. house. They go surfing some more. Stitch gets to fire dance with David because that's what he does when he's not surfing. He fire dances at the luau uh, celebrating birth holidays like Lilo's birthday and Christmas. Uh, hula dancing, all that fun stuff. Oh, one more little Disney Easter egg. Uh, A113 is the license plate number on yeah. practically <laughs> every car in the movie. The fire trucks, the gasoline truck that Stitch hijacks mm -hmm. at the end. And if you look really closely at the photo of Lilo, Stitch, and Nani washing the blue Volkswagen and Stitch spraying Nani with a water gun, A113's on the license plate on the blue Volkswagen as well. A113 is the room number at Cal Arts where a lot of Pixar animators studied film and it's a running gag in Pixar films. In fact, it's even the license plate number in Pixar films. It was Andy's mom's license plate number in the Toy Story films and later Mayer's license plate number in the Cars yeah. films. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. fun to see that in a Disney mm -hmm. film. Uh, yeah. Usually, yeah, you see the Pixar films. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why they're able to keep stitch is that lilo shows that she owns stitch she says if you take him you're stealing because she bought bought him for two dollars yeah and she's got the document mm -hmm. <laughs> <for oops. laughs> and then you also have bubbles and he, he's a ci roswell <laughs> biggest right. secret of the so, movie yeah, yeah where so you know so cobra can like comprehend like He's not questioning that they're space aliens, you know, because he's already he's already experienced them. Mm -hmm. I like. I thought that was a nice character touch. Yeah, for him, for him. And uh, then they, they, like you said, they rebuilt the house, and you see, you hear the Winona singing "Burning Love," and and I really like that. That's really fun. Yeah, I'm with you, Rachel. I love this. I think, but you know, the Hawaiian roller coaster ride, and then this end sequence where they show uh all of those photos and again the photos are are painted in watercolor so i just love the art yeah but, uh it just shows all the stuff that they've done that you know that since they formed this family and uh i think that's wonderful I, that is, that's probably you know, yeah my, mm -hmm. one of my favorite parts of, yeah. the, of the film it's and a we nice get, way to end it and we get three pop culture references uh in this photo montage we've got uh the lilo stitch nani and david going to the duke Kahama Moku statue in Oahu. Yep. They go to Elvis's Manor in Graceland. Yeah, they go nice to Graceland. <laughs> and they parody the Norman Rockwell painting, Freedom from Want, the Thanksgiving dinner photo with Stitch serving the Thanksgiving turkey, which is really cute. <laughs> I love that too. That's so great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Stanford, where do you have this? <laughs> film in your ranking well um you know i'm gonna uh, this is probably a rather unpopular opinion i actually have this film rather low because um for all the reasons that we've talked about i don't get me wrong i love the i love the watercolor art, mm -hmm. I, mean, I love the watercolor backgrounds and i love the animation i love the ohana theme i love lilo and nani's relationship and pretty much hate everything else about this film. <laughs> uh, I have it at 51. Ooh. Oh. It's Ooh. low. Wow. It's really low. Very low. Um, yeah. I, have, I have it at 22. So I'm like, oh, oh nice. Okay. I'm between okay. you guys. I okay. have, uh, I have uh, Jungle Book at 23, and I have Aladdin at 21. So. Okay, well, I'm glad uh, you like it, Rachel. Stanford, 51. Ow, that stings. <laughs> yeah, well, I knew it was going to be <laughs> probably unpopular, but that's yeah. how hey, I feel about we it. We all have those uh, unpopular Disney opinions. And like when yeah. it first came out, I would have been totally with you, but I, it has grown on me uh, quite a bit over the years. Well, uh, that's good. I actually had it higher, and then when I rewatched it, I, I had to move it lower. Move it lower? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Because I just, I do not, I just don't care, don't mm -hmm. care for it. Okay. Fair, fair enough.
I guess right. this is I guess this is what this is where I chime in with my ranking. I yes. guess, um let's see, when I first did my ranking of Disney animated canon features from Snow White to Ralph Breaks the Internet, I had mm-hmm. Lilo and Stitch at number eight, and now that Frozen 2 and Raya are out, I have it at number ten. Um it's currently right above Hercules. Hercules is my number eleven right now, and it's right below at number nine I have Aladdin. Aladdin is my favorite from the Disney Renaissance, not counting yeah. the Toy Story films. I love Aladdin, too. All right. Well, we had some great comments on Twitter. Uh, Nick Sheedy, he says, quite possibly the greatest film to come out of the post-Renaissance pre-revival era. The sisterly relationship between Nani and Lilo is one of the most realistic sibling depictions put to film. Uh, Matthew Decline says, even if I feel like Lilo and the kids can be a little bratty at times and Jamba and Pleakley's character arcs may be rushed, this film was grown on me over the years. I especially like the fun characters, the two original songs, and the overall story. ODK Corinne says, it's so good. Ohana meets family and family means no one gets left behind. Uh, The formal review says, along with Mrs. Doubtfire, it taught me at a young age that families can come in many different ways, including planets of origin. (laughs) It also allowed me to learn to imitate an alien to eventually make my wife smile and not be weird. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Paul Klein says, it's always held a place in my heart, and my two-year-old carries a a stitch with him everywhere. Oh, oh, that's cute. cute. I have Lilo and Stitch plush toys, so... Oh, nice. Uh, MC Myers says the film's management of three core perspectives, Nani, Lilo, and Stitch, is fantastically well-written until the third act. It's uncompromisingly beautiful until that entire premise with the kidnapping and spaceship chase, which distracts from the core emotions. Uh, our friend Kyle, he says, perhaps the closest thing Disney in the post-Walt age ever got to making a truly auteur driven film with such a distinct style and filmmaking choices a family drama balancing sci-fi off-kilter wackiness and very real and potent storytelling exemplary character work throughout uh boston critic says it's still classic but i kind of like treasure planet and atlantis a little more um it was run by Fruiting says truly underrated and a gem in a time period where computer animation was fully taking over. Um, let's see. There are a lot of people who showed they had stitch artwork. There's there so many comments on this one. Uh, one last one uh, says uh, Z Morgusborg says staggeringly great. What makes it so special to me is how the meaning changes at different ages. It grew with me from a movie about Lilo's perspective to one about Nani's, a deep and complex emotional fabric for the studio to say nothing of the bold, beautiful visuals and music. So there you go. Lots of great comments. Well, listen, um, well, listen before, you, before you decide what you guys are going to talk about next, I want to thank you, Rachel, for allowing me to be on this podcast with me. It's, um, it's honestly, it's helped me, um, grow a lot more. You know, I'm kind of a shy, awkward kid who has trouble making friends in personal life and out there in the real world. But being on this podcast has helped me hopefully gain more confidence, uh, sharing Disney movie memories with you guys and getting to talk about one of my favorite Disney anime can features. I really appreciate it. So thank you. We're glad to have you. It was so great to glad to have you. Thank you. Well then, yeah. Till next time to hear Rachel <laughs> and Stanford review. Yes. So next month we are going to be talking about Robin Hood. And oh, good. Finally coming the the film that is my father's favorite Disney. Film. Oh yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, we will have him on. Who knows? But, oh, good. Uh, but so- that will be fun. Good. I'm glad that Robin Hood is next because between the final two films before Encanto, I was hoping you'd get Robin Hood first because Peter Pan is the better of the tale as far as critics mm-hmm. and I are concerned. And then um, and then uh, after you're done with Robin Hood and Peter Pan, it won't be completely over because then you'll have to review Encanto for the holidays. <laughs> yep. It's going to be, yeah. be exciting. Yeah. So, yeah. Exciting. Robin Hood, it's, a, it's, in my opinion, a lot of fun. And uh, so it'll be great to talk about. And so thank you, Jai, for coming. Do you have any social media you want to share or any your blog um, or anything like that? 
Well, I don't, I go to Facebook occasionally, but I don't really, uh, talk a lot on Facebook or Twitter or anything like that, but if any of you guys want to send me, um, comments or, or <laughs> encourage me to do more, uh, uh, film reviews or whatever, you can email me at jcrmielke -E at gmail.com. Or, if you type in my first and last name, Josiah Milky, on YouTube, I have video reviews of almost the entire Disney anime canon, from Snow White to Frozen 2. I haven't reviewed Raya yet. Most of the Pixar films, from Toy Story to Toy Story 4, and my sister and I did a review of the Disney Channel series, Elena of Avalor, between its second and third seasons. So, mm -hmm. if you want to check those out, uh, that'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. We'll have that information in the description. Stanford, what about you? On Twitter, I'm at Stanford Clark. I have a movie podcast and blog at moviespastandpresent.com. And I'm also on Instagram at moviespap which stands for past and present. Great. And you can find me at Rachel's Reviews, all of our social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Rotten Tomatoes. So check all of that out, please. And then also make sure to check out the Hallmarkies podcast. A lot of fun stuff going on over there. And make sure you take a look at our merch store. We have hashtag animation junkie shirts. And we really appreciate that. Please like this video. Please subscribe to the channel. We also have our Patreon group where we get to talk about Disney or anything else that people want to talk about. It's only $2 a month help support us in doing what we do. And I really, really appreciate that support. And all that information is in the description. And so thanks so much, everybody. And we'll talk to you all later. Bye. Bye. Bye.